Afternoon, everybody. Thank you for taking the time out um, from what's proved to be a very busy Plaza Focus 2011 to uh, take a look at um, some spectrum issues uh, ongoing. Um, for those of you uh, that don't know me, uh, my name is Alan March. I work for Sennheiser UK. Uh, I also sit on the Berg Steering Committee. Berg is the British Entertainment Industry Radio Group. Uh, and we have been uh, in and out of Ofcom now more times than <laughs> perhaps we would. <laughs> that maybe wasn't the most eloquent way to put that, actually. Yeah, so, uh, this is John Stephen. Uh, for those that don't know, John Stephen is also a fellow member of the uh, uh, Berg Steering Committee. Um, so the idea of this presentation is, is not really to, speci uh, to specifically uh, concentrate on equipment uh, per se. Uh, it's more really to give people an, an understanding of how we've got to the position that we're in currently uh, and what the potential uh, consequences are for the future uh, in terms of accessing uh, a resource which hopefully you'll discover after the end of this presentation is something that uh, we have maybe taken for granted uh, but that other uh, interested parties are quite keen to get access to and get their hands on. So, uh, what is the future? Uh, for wireless microphones and in monitors uh, for this country and in Europe. So let's start with uh, a brief history of uh, traditionally how Spectrum has been managed. How do we get here? Um, spectrum management's got about a 100-year history. Um, and up until relatively recently, um, it was managed on what was uh, what's called a command and control basis. So in other words, the regulator uh, took technical decisions uh, based on uh, what it felt were the right uses for the right bands, uh, in order that they would not inter in, in order that services would not interfere with each other. Uh, interference mitigation is critical. Uh, there's no point in having two services side by side that uh, interfere with each other, uh, therefore rendering both of them <coughs> redundant or useless. Um, this guy, Ronald Coase, uh, back in 1959. Uh, was the first guy who uh, really began to think about Spectrum uh, as a resource um, that could be uh, auctioned, traded, um, and in, in those days, back in 1959, the FCC, which is the American equivalent to Ofcom, uh, didn't really take him very seriously at all. However, um, over time, uh, these ideas uh, began to gain traction, 1980. Uh, a guy called William H. Melody uh, produced the, a document called Radio Spectrum Allocation and the role of the market in allocation of spectrum. Um, so over time, um, these ideas were taken on board uh, by more and more uh, economists and academics. So in turn, um, this has led to uh, regulators globally um, looking to the market to decide uh, what is the best way uh, to make the best use of what is effectively a finite resource, uh, radiomagnetic spectrum. Uh, and uh, increasingly they look to do this through a market-based approach. Um, so getting closer to the current day, um, the drive for the release of what has effectively been broadcast spectrum uh, has been driven by the mobile network operators, or the MNOs as we refer to them. Um, why do they want Spectrum? Well, UHF Spectrum is, as Ofcom describe it, the sweet spot. It's a very good Spectrum. Uh, you can carry a lot of data, it travels a long way. Uh, and so therefore, it's a very attractive uh, resource to get access to. Um, and it's the, it's, the, it's the bare resource on which they, they base the, growth, the future growth of their business. Um, so the, the mobile network operators have uh, worked very closely uh, with regulators uh, to in, order, in order to ensure that any new spectrum that is uh, freed up or released uh, is kind of guided, if, we, if you like, into their hands so that they can facilitate new growth. Um, a, a common way that spectrum is now allocated is, is through an auction process, uh, and that auction process, you know, those auction processes or these auction processes are effectively now pretty mainstream, and there have been many examples where Spectrum has been auctioned in different countries around the world. And indeed, in this country, we had the 3G auction. Uh, that raised 
uh, a total of £22.5 billion pounds for the, uh, Her Majesty's Treasury. Uh, I think it's now accepted that uh, perhaps the uh, mobile companies overbid slightly on that particular occasion, and I don't think that uh, the Treasury will be looking to receive anywhere near that amount for the upcoming 800 megahertz auctions. But how? But uh, you can see that the sort of amounts of money that were, that were raised, not just here, but in Germany as well, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, Spectrum auctions uh, began to have the full and undivided attention of politicians and civil servants. And there's a great big sack of cash, which uh, we uh, went into Her Majesty's Treasury back in 2000. It's a lot of money for fresh air. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, this guy, Martin Cave, uh, he uh, was, uh, well, before we go on to Martin, um, so effectively at that point in time it looked to be a win-win-win situation. The MNOs got their spectrum. Uh, the regulator was seen to be maximising the use of the uh, of, of spectrum for public good. Uh, and of course the government got a, a handy pile of cash. So they then looked to see where else can these principles be applied. Uh, Gordon Brown in 2001 uh, commissioned Martin Cave to uh, draw up a report, uh, and that report was the Cave Review, which was published in 2002. Uh, 262 pages long, so quite a, a mighty tome. Uh, the main thrust uh, was the continued liberalisation of spectrum via market-based mechanisms, uh, and also uh, one of Martin's uh, key aims and objectives is to try to introduce secondary trading of spectrum. So in other words, when somebody's bought some spectrum, uh, they don't have to hang on to it, they can then move it on to an another third party if they wish. Uh, in practice, that very rarely happens. The only real spectrum trades we've seen, particularly in this country so far, has been when one company has bought another company that just happens to have a spectrum holding. That's not true spectrum trading, but that, that's all we've really seen so far. Uh, and in fact, um, it's a bit worse than that. Uh, what we tend to see is that when companies do secure <coughs> spectrum, uh, they tend to hang on to it. Uh, four years ago, uh, Qualcomm uh, bought what we call the L-band, which is 1452 to 1492 megahertz. Uh, they've had that for four years and they've done absolutely nothing with it. So there's a big chunk of 50, nearly 50 megs of spectrum there, which is just sitting there idle, doing nothing. That's not an efficient use of spectrum, I would not say. Really. But, uh, the, you know, but, um, that kind of it goes against one of the main Ofcom principles, does it not? John, what's it all about? It's about maximising the use of the resource to gain the maximum benefit to all the citizens and consumers of the United Kingdom. Okay. It's not about the money, apparently. <laughs> you can tell we've heard that before. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, moving on, where Spectrum was allocated to public services, uh, it was suggested that something called administered incentive pricing was applied um, in order that um, the, true, the resource's true market value could be recouped. Uh, and it also called for flexibility uh, in order that Spectrum policy uh, should be able to cope with new technologies. Uh, and this is the interesting, interesting bit, both known and as yet unknown. So how you make policy for something that's yet unknown, I'm not quite sure. So an unknown, uh, unknown. Thank you, John. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so um, getting closer to where we are today. Um, broadcast Spectrum has traditionally been sacrosanct. Um, where is, what, are we what frequencies are we talking about? Well, we're talking about from, all the way from 470 megahertz all the way up to 854, which is the bottom channel 69. Uh, it's traditionally been reserved solely for broadcasting, and what used to be called services ancillary to broadcasting, SAP, SAP rather, or SAP, services ancillary to uh, program making. Uh, it's now commonly referred to as program making and special events, but it's all the same stuff, PMSE. Uh, and we've been using that spectrum now for in excess of 40 years. Um, However, um, when the plan was put into place to switch over from analogue television to digital, uh, it was decided, obviously, that uh, digital transmissions are much more efficient than uh, analogue ones, and so far fewer frequencies were going to be required. Uh, what they really failed to take into account was the fact that um, we were using those frequencies. Uh, and one of the reasons for that, uh, which we'll touch on a little bit later, is the, uh, shall we say, um, well, the lack of uh, people's, uh, not ability, but the, the reluctance to license, shall we say, which is actually a legal requirement. But anyway, we, it was very difficult at, the, at that stage to demonstrate just how much spectrum was being used. Um, anyway, uh, so far fewer frequencies. Um, so the academics and the economists and the regulators all got together, and the MNOs, uh, and the result of that was the digital, div digital, 
the Digital Dividend Review. Uh, it was published in 2006, uh, and it identified two areas, well, in the UK anyway, it identified two areas of spectrum uh, which could at least, in theory, be reallocated for new uses. <coughs> Uh, so at this point, this is where things were starting to get a little bit controversial. Um, not the best. This was the original uh, plan. You can see here, that's Channel 38, which I guess got a bunch of you have heard about. Uh, at that point, we had radar in here as well. So this is what's commonly referred to as the lower cleared band, and this is what's referred to as the upper cleared band here. So at that point in time, PMSE was still see, uh, seen as being included. Uh, in, well, Channel 69 was, was going to be retained for PMSE use. Um, and, as I say, radio astronomy was splitting, along with radar, was splitting the lower cleared band. Radar has now been moved out, so that is also now cleared. Uh, and, as we know, Channel 38 has now been reallocated for PMSE use. Um, so, here we have the existing band plan. This changed here as a result of World Radio Conference 07. The decision was taken that this was too narrow and that, in fact, 790 to 854 should be the entire upper clear band in as many countries across Europe as possible. Um, and it's this movement from <coughs> PMSE being allowed and stated by Ofcom that we were going to be allowed to continue there to being effectively booted out, that was the hook on which uh, we, we, able, we were able to uh, crowbar, shall we say, the uh, funding or compensation scheme, whatever you like to call it, out of Ofcom, because they basically said yes there, and then they had to change their mind. So they really moved a bit too quickly, uh, and as a result, that gave us an opportunity to uh, fight for the funding deal. So, where are we at the moment? This is um, 470 down here. This is your upper cleared band. This will be eventually sold um, and it will be uh, used uh, to run new mobile broadband services, 4G phone technology, LTE. Um, here's channel 38. And here, this is what's called the lower clear band. Now, once Ofcom have sold this, in conjunction with some 2.6 gigahertz spectrum, which is obviously further up the frequency scale. Uh, we have it on good authority that the next area of interest is this lower cleared band. Now, there are significant differences between the upper cleared band and the lower cleared band. Uh, here, this is available, or will be available, more or less across Europe. So, from a, a mobile operator's point of view, uh, that's great, because they get economies of scale in terms of uh, networks and handsets and all the rest of it. Uh, there are notable exceptions. Italy is one, where this is completely stuffed full of broadcast. And who owns the broadcasters? Berlusconi. Well, we'll see whether he, uh, <coughs> we'll see whether he hangs on, but uh, you know, there we go. The difference with the lower clear band is that um, it's a UK-only phenomenon. So uh, not as much, well, no interest really from the mobile operators for, that, for those frequencies, but there are other technologies that could be deployed in there. Uh, potentially WiMAX, potentially uh, Tetra, uh, emergency services system. So uh, we need to keep an eye on that. Uh, however, recent thinking seems to be that there, there is another possibility, which is that two new uh, digital television muxes could be released. Now, if that happens, that's good news for us because this just becomes more what we call interleaf spectrum or white space spectrum, and that's what all of this green stuff is here. So on. On that chart, that looks all great because it's all clear, right? Well, except for the fact that in, in any given geographical location, a lot of these channels will be, ta will be taken up with broadcasting, uh, it, be it digital or in the areas where analog is still current analog. So it's, it's not quite as rosy as that picture paints, but you can see there's quite a lot of interleaf spectrum there at the moment. Uh, but this is the next area of interest for the mobile guys. And in fact, there was an Ofcom update that came out today which is advising stakeholders, because we're all stakeholders, to uh, uh, put in their uh, requirements and what they think their requirements are for UHF spectrum going forward. Um, and I think the gist of that is that the mobile, oh, you know, the mobile companies are looking to get at least another 100 megs. 
So here we've got channel 70. A bit misleading, it's not the whole of channel 70, it's not the whole 8 megs, it's only 2 megs. That's license exempt use. Uh, however, bear in mind that here is the top of the is going to be the top of the mobile broadband uh, slice of spectrum. How usable this is going to be in the future is uh, well debatable to say the least. Um, I find it hard to believe currently that you know th these th this area here will be the downlinks from the transmitters, and the upper frequencies will be the uplinks from the devices. Now, those devices might be embedded in laptops, they might be handheld devices, they might be dongles. Um, how, you know, even if there are strict standards applied to the manufacturing of these units, um, how good the filtering is going to be on cheaply mass-produced mass devices is questionable. Uh, so I think it's conceivable that we're going to see out-of-band interference in Channel 70. This won't happen until the new networks are up and running. And for that, we're looking at 2013, 2014, assuming there is no more litigation between mobile phone companies as to spectrum allocations. But uh, we need to keep an eye on that, because uh, there's a lot of activity in there, not just in terms of community use of wireless microphones, but also um, radio wireless headphones, uh, baby alarms, also any sort of wireless audio device is, is, is allowed to operate there currently license exempt. And who knows, if, uh, if it does turn out that the uh, interference is, is significant, uh, there may be a claim, again, for uh, potentially compensating people. But we'll have to see uh, when we get there on that one. So I hope that's relatively clear. Um, right, so is the pattern of access going to change further in the future? Well, yes. Um, the mobile network operators have spent millions of pounds uh, consultants, lobbyists, all to prove that the best value to society will be achieved if the 800 megahertz band is allocated for 4G mobile phone use. And that money was well spent. They've effectively got what they want. They're arguing the, the, the terms of the auction and all the rest of it, but they're effectively going to get what they want. Um, and they've also seen off any other comp comp competing users for the band. At the beginning of the debate, there was, there was, um, let's just go back a couple of, you know, right at the beginning, it was up for debate as to whether or not this would be more TV. Uh, there were all sorts of players that could have made use of this, but the mobile phone companies are the guys that have, uh, somewhat unsurprisingly, given the amount of money they've got, uh, won the argument. But it's not about the money, um, obviously. Uh, okay, so there are other competing users for the band, um, and as I said when we were looking at the chart, 790 to 862, as far as the mobile guys are concerned, is not enough. They want at least another 100 megahertz, all the way down to 694 megs. Uh, which would bring Europe more or less in line with the States, for example. So that's what they're actively campaigning for. Um, however, in order to do that, um, this would require the complete replanning of the entire DTT network. So although it's in theory possible, it's not out of the question. Uh, you should also be aware that there is a, a kind of school of thought in the whole debate that actually thinks that DTV, uh, digital, you know, DTT transmissions are a complete waste of spectrum and that in a, in a world where we can get television through LTE on our new handset devices or through cable networks, or fiber optics, satellites, uh, there is no need for D, uh, DTT anymore. Uh, they would have the whole band cleared uh, in order to make use of it for mobile broadband uh, because we all need lots and lots of mobile broadband, right? How quickly can you load your pictures to Facebook, John? I don't Not have quick enough, right? I don't have Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> no idea what it is. No, but uh, you get the point. Anyway, so um, yeah, so these these people regard DTT as a, as a as a waste of valuable spectrum. And you know, the the problem here is that these sort of ideas, once they get into regulators and once politicians get hold of it, who maybe don't necessarily understand the full unintended consequences of what could happen, uh, they begin to gain traction. And that's exactly what happened with the upper clear band. Um, so, yeah, they're probably going to take years to implement, but they could, in theory, be uh, on the horizon. So, we really operate under an umbrella of, you know, wireless microphone users, we operate under a, a kind of a, an umbrella of protection, shall we say, from broadcast. Um, so, when events like, uh, uh, you know, the U2 360 tour, Madonna, um, X Factor, in television land, even 
things like Strictly Come Dancing. You'd be amazed to know that Strictly Come Dancing's got nearly 70 channels of wireless on it. Um, and we couldn't run those multi-channel systems without access to interleave frequencies. Um, but as compression techniques evolve in broadcast, uh, it's conceivable that, you know, again, they'll take the decision that less, uh, fewer frequencies are required in order to deliver TV. Uh, and that's not going to go unnoticed by other interested parties such as mobile network operators. Um, and any, it follows logically that any reduction in interleave spectrum uh, without the specific allocation of dedicated spectrum for PMSE activities uh, will increasingly make increasingly difficult deployment of large multi-channel wireless systems. Um, so yeah, the, the content that we all consume, whether it's TV, <coughs> theatre, uh, live music, uh, sports events, uh, you know, all of these events rely on access to a large quantity of interference-free interleave spectrum. Uh, so, so far we've talked about uh, the mobile network operators, but there are also other interested parties. Um, this guy, I apologise, this, this PowerPoint is a little bit out of date. Um, this is Professor William Webb. He's actually no longer at Ofcom. He's gone. He's gone, yes. Um, possibly as a result of some of our activities, although I'm not entirely sure. Um, he is, has been a great proponent for what was called cognitive, uh, then became white space devices, and, and the current parlance is, I believe, dynamic spectrum access devices. That's the latest phrase. I think they figure if they change the name often enough, they'll actually just think this is something totally different. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, so, so, so these guys are looking to... So on the one hand, we've got Vodafone and all those guys, and on the other hand, we've got Microsoft, Dell, Google, Motorola. So, you know, small companies that, you know, we shouldn't, shouldn't have to worry about too much, you know. Uh, and they're looking to develop these uh, white space devices or dynamic spectrum access devices. Um, how are these things going to work? Well, the theory goes thus. Um, your device, whether it, again, is embedded in a computer or whether it's a dongle that plugs into a USB socket or whether it's a handheld device, will communicate with a centrally held or a network of, of, of databases which tell the device which frequencies they can and cannot use based on the database which is populated with where, what frequencies where are being used for broadcast and who the registered PMSE users are. Um, how will these devices communicate with the database? By GPS. So how that's going to work indoors, no one really knows. But um, anyway, that's the theory. Um, and they're very keen to stress that as far as they're concerned, uh, this is not going to cause any interference with licensed users whatsoever. However, we would beg to differ. We, we, we think that there's a huge interference potential here, uh, not just for um, wireless microphone users, but also for every potential television user that uses a set-top antenna or a box. Um, so, yeah, he's, um, he, he's now gone. Uh, and in fact, last week, wasn't it, we had a meeting with his, the, the guy boy. that's picked up the cognitive portfolio, um, a guy called Gary Clemo. Um, I didn't, get, I didn't actually get the impression that he was absolutely delighted to be in that position. Uh, no, no, he didn't seem, he didn't didn't seem, seem that keen. overly infused. I think the fundamental difference between, um, although we haven't really had that much interaction with, with, with Gary yet, but um, apart from, aside from this one meeting, but, uh, you know, Webb has been a real a champion for, for white space devices. He's, he really believes that this can work. He thinks it's going to be fantastic. He's a professor out of Cambridge. You know, he doesn't necessarily see the potential practical pitfalls of, of, of it, when and if these things are uh, released into the, into the wild, should we say. Um, however, Gary is much more of a kind of pragmatic career, I use the term civil servant loosely because he's working for a quango, but, and I think by the end of the meeting, uh, he definitely got the impression, or, or didn't, went away with a, uh, definitely the impression that, um, that if they screw up on this and they end up you know, causing untold interference and problems. Uh, there is, uh, what's the phrase? Severe career-limiting career potential. Limiting. Yes, so, um, so I think he's a bit more of a pragmatist. Uh, so we'll see, hopefully the, 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 the train will slow down a little bit on white space devices. But again, we need to keep an eye on it because, uh, you know, if, if these things are released into the wild without being 
properly uh, uh, proper standards applied. There are there is work going on in Europe, CEPT, uh, uh, places like that, uh, Etsy, uh, to try and ensure that there's a harmonised European standard for these devices. And it's critical that um, Ofcom don't, like they did with Channel 69, press ahead and do their own thing, uh, only to find that they then have to roll back because European standards have been applied over and above uh, what what Ofcom have believed to be the right way to go. Um, yeah, I mean, what, there are so many areas of concern with this. You know, it's a, it's a completely untried thing to have two different potentially interfering users of Spectrum trying to share the same resource. And so uh, there needs to be a lot of work uh, done to ensure that this is going to work properly. You know, who, who, who's going to run the database? Who's going to populate it? If, you know, if, it is, if the database is, is run by a company that has interests in making sure that white space devices work efficiently for, for consumers, um, how long is it until they maybe start casually disregarding some of the PMSC allocations because they're getting complaints that these white space devices can't get on and off air? So, you know, th th there's a lot of work to be done. I, um, think, I think a crucial point here as well is when you actually read the, the, the consultation documents on white space devices, according to the consultation, it actually puts these products over as actually being... Uh, you know, devices that will be help in rural areas and help farming machinery and uh, and uh, that's a bit disingenuous because all you need to do is actually search on the internet and you'll actually find exactly what these devices will be. They will be small, handheld, internet, mass market devices. Yeah. Totally not what the consultation says they're going to be. Yeah. And I that's mean, that's where the real danger is here. And, you know, Where's the worst possible scenario for the, if these things are let out into the wild? Um, what's the worst possible scenario? Well, it's a, well, it's any concert, any, any you know, if you've got ten thousand people in an audience, um, and you've got forty channels of PMSE on stage, it only takes one white space device to either be faulty or to have had a jailbreak protocol applied to it. Don't look at don't look at the geolocation database to ask me whether I can operate. Just yeah. operate. Yeah. It only takes one device to ruin that performance. And it's not just the performance that will be ruined. It's all the downstream revenue flow from that as well. So your DVD is ruined, your sound recording, your broadcast. You know, so um, it's, it's potentially extremely disruptive. And in, in many ways, uh, it's much more dangerous, or white space devices have the potential to be much more dangerous than the mobile guys. Yes, the mobile guys want spectrum, but you know exactly where they are. They buy their spectrum, you know exactly where they're operating. The idea is that these things will leap on and off of frequencies, license exempt, anytime, anywhere. So um, we need to maintain pressure, uh, not just at a national level, but also at a, a European level as well, to prevent the steamrolling through of those standards. So. <laughs> <laughs> doomed. We're all doomed. Actually, you could say that better than me, John. Yes, but I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yes and no. Um, you know, there are organisations that have been on this for a while. Uh, Berg, myself and John sit on the steering committee, the seven of us in total. Trimo, I'm sure, as well. He's not, un he's, unfortunately, he's got to go, I had to go back to London so he couldn't make this meeting. So, you know, Berg is not about uh, any one individual manufacturer. It's, it's an attempt to pull a collective of people together to show, put on a front for the industry as a whole. To, in order to make sure that regulators and economists and politicians understand that this industry needs access to a reasonable amount of spectrum in order to continue doing what it does. Um, so we have Berg, British Entertainment Industry, uh, and on a European level, we have the snappily titled APWPT. Um, that's kind of like an Uber Berg, but for Europe. Uh, and also, uh, Matthias Fair, who's the chair of, of APWPT, is also trying to make that more of a global organisation as well. So we, we've got tie-ins with the, the Australian Wireless Action Group uh, and others as well. NAM, are a member of APWPT as well. So uh, that's all ongoing. And I'm the national, uh, at the moment, the national ambassador for, for that organisation as well for the UK. Um, but the only reason we can do all this, Berg in particular, is through funding. Now, I'm not going to bang on too much about this, but if any of you in this room have benefited from the funding scheme, then you should really seriously think about, and you haven't at any time put any money into Berg, then you should absolutely think about that very, very carefully. You know, there's a lot of people that have benefited 
hugely from the work that myself and John and the other members of the steering committee, in conjunction with Ranela, our lobbying company, uh, have achieved. Um, and I hope you can see from what I've just said with white space devices, you know, a lot of people said, oh, well, you know, we've got the funding scheme, it's great, so it's all over now. It's not all over. There's constant pressure from other organisations and other, and other uh, industries to get access to, the, to, a, to a resource that we in this industry seem to take for granted. And it's not a given. Even broadcasters, I sat in a meeting at the EBU back last year, and they continually throughout the whole meeting talked about our frequencies, our frequencies, our frequencies. And it got to the end of the meeting, and I just said, look, guys, you've got to wake up. They're not your frequencies. They are frequencies that you use, but from a regulatory perspective, the regulator looks at it as, well, what's the, what's the most beneficial use to society of these frequencies? And if the regulator takes the view because they've been persuaded by a mobile network operator or by a white space device developer that more benefit to society will be gained from using those frequencies for their use rather than others, then they will seriously consider that. And I'm a bit disappointed that the broadcasters haven't been more proactive in this whole thing. Yeah. We've had you know, messages of support and all the rest of it, but um, I, just, I just wonder sometimes. So this, this, this is the only country in the world that's actually managed to achieve a funding scheme like this. The only country in the world. And the only reason it's the only country in the world that's actually done it is because of the way that we've gone about this. And if you want to change government policy, you need to understand and work with government. And the only way to do that is to have political lobbying people who understand and can get to the right people. And those guys cost money. Okay. And so far in the five years since we've been doing this, Berg has begged, stolen and borrowed to the tune of nearly £400,000 to achieve this funding campaign. And that's only one part of what we're trying to do. Yeah, so but, it's, but it's not just about... Sorry, the it's, money. It's, it's not just about the funding campaign or the funding scheme. It's about, it's about rec fundamental recognition at regulatory and at, and at political level that we do, about what we do and how we do it. I remember giving the first presentation to a guy called Philip Rutland back in 2006. They had no idea that we even existed, and they're the regulator. So it's not just about gaining a funding scheme. Yes, it's about trying to make sure that we get frequencies in the future, but the, the way that we get frequencies in the future and, and ensure access is to you know, absolutely make sure that they know that we're here and they understand what we do and they understand just how much resource we need to do it. Now, fortunately, yeah, we've kicked above our weight or punched above our weight maybe in the UK, but also PMSE is now on the agenda at European Commission level as well. So there have been several discussions and meetings now held at the European Commission level where PMSE has finally at last got some recognition. But the, the point of this is you c just because you've got some recognition today does not mean that you're going to get that same recognition tomorrow. You have to keep the whole thing moving all the time. So, and that, unfortunately, takes money. So, there you go. I'm not going to say any more about that. I've probably banged on enough about trying to raise We'll pass money. the hat round later. Um, so, what, 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 what have we achieved? Well, as John said, you know, we've got a completely <coughs> unique situation in the UK. We've, we've managed to get a funding scheme out, out of government. There's the, there's the wording. Wonderful. Um, and it's come as a direct result of the, of the Save Our Sound campaign, which while we enlisted the headings of many organisations, were basically driven by Berg. Um, Ofcom has appointed <coughs> Equinity to administer it. Uh, as I say, apologies, a little bit out of date. The, the claimants had to register their claim by the end of December 2010, which many, many people did. Um, what were the criteria? Well, had to have a channel, valid Channel 69 licence between the 2nd of February and the 2nd of uh, 2008 and the 2nd of February 2009. I'm just going to whiz through this because it's kind of history really now. But these were, these were some of the eligibility criteria. Um, that was quite a key win. Mm. Originally, um, Ofcom's view was any equipment over five years old will be ineligible. And um, we said, well, hang on a minute. It's not like a car. It doesn't really have any moving parts. We can take you to the West End and we can show you a, a, a rack of receivers that's been there working perfectly for 15 years. Um, to a rental company. Uh, a brand new wireless microphone that's rented out gets the same rental value as a 10-year old uh, radio microphone that's rented out. So we won that one. But there were others. We tried to get the. We, we obviously we tried to get the, the the criteria opened up as much as possible. But they also had certain red lines which they wouldn't go beyond. 
but uh, but even so, it's still quite a um, quite a significant win to get to get the deal out. Um, and then shameless promotion of products. Uh, there they are. <laughs> Basically, we've got loads of Channel 38 compatible gear now, and more on the way. Uh, yeah, and most of that stuff is now tunable from 38 up. And the reason we've done that is because there's still this uncertainty about what will happen to TV bands 31 to 37, which are the frequencies below channel 38. So we've taken the view that the, for the most pragmatic approach at the moment is to develop equipment that can tune to all of channel 38, and then as many of the interleaf frequencies above channel 38 as uh, whatever the range is tuning uh, range will, will, will allow, basically. Um, that's it for the presentation. Um, any questions? Don't be shy. Hello. Sorry, just on the, um, you saying your, this, the stuff you've got now, which are tuned from channel 38, but... No, not, uh, no we, have, we have lots of equipment yeah. that tunes across yeah. lots of different tuning ranges, but the new equipment that we've been developing yeah. has been specific, uh, we've had ranges built that will tune from the bottom of 38 upwards. Now for our G3 systems, for example, they have a 42 megahertz tuning range. Yeah. So, so that our G3, GB range variant starts at the bottom of channel 38 and goes up for 42 megahertz. Our 2000 GBW series, which has just started shipping, that's got a tuning range of about 75 megahertz. So that starts again at 606 megs and goes up for 75 megahertz. That's getting into the spectrum then? It goes into interleaved spectrum, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, you know... That's also the spectrum, where you say, that the white space devices are now looking to get... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they're looking at they're looking at white space devices being able to access, being able to access, uh, with the exception of channel 38, any frequencies between 470 to 790. So we'd be effectively losing any channels we buy within that. Well, no, because if you're doing the right thing, yeah. and actually this is an old presentation, I've just realised I've run the old one. What is absolutely critical is that people license, right. and there are that one. It's a legal requirement, okay, and you know when people were buying channel 69 equipment invariably it would also tune to the two megs of, inter of, of license exempt spectrum in channel 70 and so people's argument would be oh i don't need to buy a license because i only ever use it in the in the dereg frequencies well you can't do that with channel 38 equipment there is no deregulated spectrum down in that area so you have to have some form of license to be legal and that's either a shared at the moment 69 and 38 license or if you're operating on frequencies outside of channel 38, a fixed site license for where, when, and for how long. So in order to legally comply, you need to have a license. Secondly, if you don't license, it's the only way that we can demonstrate accurately just how much wireless microphone use there is going on out there. Okay? Now, back when they were planning, re-planning re the DTT, platform, which was, what, 10 years ago, 12 years ago, however yeah. long it was, if at that point in time everybody who should have been licensed was, it would have been much more difficult for them to say, oh yeah, well, we're just going to clear this band out, because we could have demonstrated just how much use was going on. But unfortunately, for various reasons, and manufacturers are probably partly culpable, possibly, uh, end user. You know, the, the, let's be clear, the, the, the onus to have a licence is on the user, okay? But, you know, Ofcom have been absolutely rubbish at promoting that. JFMG, who are the licensing operation, um, good organisation, but were only ever put in place uh, to act as a cost-covering exercise. So they really don't have any money to, to, to market and go out there and say you should be licensing, okay? Ofcom have, been, have done nothing to, 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 to push that. And although most manufacturers, responsible manufacturers, will say, you know, this, 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 this article, this, this piece of equipment uh, needs to be licensed, at the end of the day, the, the onus is on the user. So, yeah, legal requirement. We need to be able to demonstrate in the future just how much spectrum we use on a day-to-day -day basis. Thirdly, with regard to white space devices, when and if they arrive, if you're not licensed, they won't know you're there. So consequently, you will get stamped on. If you are licensed, make, you know, there's, a clear, there's a clear hierarchy here, in theory at least, which is 
licensed users take precedent over unlicensed users. So if you've got your frequencies in the database and they're licensed, in theory, the white space device won't interfere with you. But it won't, it, but it doesn't know that. It doesn't know not to interfere with you unless you're registered on the database. Well, by the way, this database doesn't exist yet. Oh, and that's 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 and that actually is our biggest Absolutely. that's our biggest fear and the one which we pressed home when we we met Ofcom last week. We've seen it in so many other different areas. When you've got a device which is not meant for farming in rural. How many people actually think that Dell, Microsoft and Google are interested in farming or people that live in the middle of nowhere? Yeah. Nobody. These are small handheld internet devices and as such, will they will get, somebody will come along literally on day one that will write a jailbreak program, same as they have for I, iPhones and everything else, that will effectively say, don't look for the geolocation database in order to work. Bypass that and just operate. And you know what? Once that actually happens, nothing that Ofcom can actually do to stop it. So the only way to actually truly regulate these things is A, don't allow them in the first place, or secondly, don't allow them to occupy the same spectrum as wireless microphones. What's, what's happened in America is that they've effectively uh, allocated what they call safe harbour channels for PMSE. They had not allocated enough by any stretch of the imagination, but they have at least done it. So they, these are TV bands in America, they're six megs, not eight megs, um, which are specifically set aside for radio microphones. White space devices can't go in there. Um, so we're we're for... The Sorry? No, the actual, no, the actual, no. The actual products... So the actual products actually aren't on the market. What the FCC have effectively done is actually approved yeah, everything to go forward with it. However, the important thing to bear in mind that in America compared to the UK, where white space devices for internet access, etc., makes a lot of sense in America is because it's a huge country, you've lots of vast open areas where you don't necessarily have a high population. That's not the case in somewhere like Britain. Right. Now, so far in the UK, the testing, they've done it in places like, well, the latest one was in the Isle of Butte. Yeah. Now, forgive Density me, but I don't, re I don't remember the Isle of Butte being on the, the last U2 World Tour rotor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, Maybe that, and, that one. I mean, and there are other things as well. I mean, uh, uh, how, you know, we will obviously push as hard as possible to make sure that there are very strict standards on the manufacture of these devices. But, you know, standards can slip. And uh, a good example, I guess, I was talking to a guy the other day, um, it, the home plug devices that you plug into your, to, to the wall in order to squirt the, the web around your house on the same ring main. If you take a look at the picture of the, of the original device that was submitted for testing, and then take a look at the actual device that's on the market two years later, all of the filtering, all of, the, all of that stuff that got it through the testing is no longer in there. Okay, so all these things need to be addressed, and you know, I don't know of any other organisation, aside from Berg, that is putting these questions to our wonderful regulator. So, you know, yes, we've got a compensation deal. Great, that is one chapter of a much longer story, and at the moment we don't know when it's going to end. If they get all the 470 to 790 for mobile broadband, yes, well. That might, that'll be another end of a chapter, and we'll have to move somewhere else. But, you know, again, unless we're in there pitching all the time, um, then we do run the risk of being brushed aside. I don't, you know, I don't think we will be now. I mean, I think we've done enough to, to certainly give them a bloody nose. £60 million pounds of a bloody nose, but there we are. Um, so, yeah, so we'll have to see. But uh, if nothing else, if you go away from this presentation today, I just want you to understand that, you know, there is continual pressure for access to this resource. It is finite. The regulator, um, although they are more aware now of what we do than they were five years ago, um, you know, the, 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 the arguments that go in from, on the one side, the likes of Microsoft and Dell, and from the other side, Vodafone are very persuasive. Uh, and we need to be in there and keep, keep, keep fighting. And they, they, have the, they have the benefit, obviously, of huge amounts of money to spend on lobbying and uh, PR campaigns and everything else that goes along with it much easier for them to actually make a case and you know I think you know we've all probably had 
people talking recently about you know how the you know more mobile broadband broadband will actually help get the economy back in its feet. And these are all the arguments that it actually makes, and you know it's a pretty persuasive and powerful argument. Yeah, I mean how, how it works is Vodafone go to an organisation with a name that means nothing that probably ends in a vowel, like Sagentia or one of these uh, <laughs> consultants. They pay them a lot of money, and they say we want you to produce a report that demonstrates conclusively that the best use for this resource is mobile broadband. Yeah. So Sagentia take the money, go away, write a 120-page report, feed it back. The regulator then says, look. This is all good. This is this is the future. And then what happens is politicians read that or get told that. And, you know, and I've been to countless, well not countless, but I've been to a few meetings in Brussels where one politician after another has just got up and repeated off wrote, you know, this is the way forward, this is going to bring us out of recession, you know, the, the reallocation of frequencies is crucial. Well is it? I can't I can't tell you how many how many um, consultations we've been actually involved in um, giving information to that have never, ever seen the light of day. Yeah. And the only reason they never, ever saw the light of day is because they didn't come up with the right answer. Yeah. I mean, it is a bit, you know, maybe it's an overly cynical view, and maybe I've been doing it too long, but it is a bit like they've kind of, well, in fact, the white space, though, I asked, I asked Gary, it's a bit like they make the decision to do something. Now they have to make it. And fit. then they have to put the consultation together in order to justify the decision. It's kind of the wrong way around. And it's the same thing with white space devices. I said to Gary Clemmer last week, I said, so, you know, just to get this clear in my head, you've already made the decision to allow white space devices, and now it's just a question of making sure that they don't interfere. Is that not the wrong way around? Should you actually, first of all, ensure that they're not going to interfere before making the decision to allow them? And he didn't really have an answer to that, did he? No, because it's government policy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, any other questions? Hello. You mentioned uh, entertainment, which obviously you're mainly interested in, mm. but there are other uses of radio mics. Uh, it's used very often in uh, monitoring people who are suffering from, from injuries, mm. uh, where the monitoring is then is sent by radio, not through the internet, because that's, well, A, it's not very secure, and, and B, well, that's the main thing. But uh, also, phonic ears, which I mentioned yeah, before so that, we yeah, started. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I don't know how many people have come across uh, deaf people, but profoundly deaf people and youngsters, they use a use of phonic ear, which basically is a radio mic connected to a, a receiver the youngster has on them. Yes, they use frequencies, use radio frequencies. Uh, they're also, also, you look at a big building site. Yeah. That requires. You look at a place like this, the Royal Armouries and uh, Savile Hall. They use radio mics mm. to get hold of people. Well, you know, I, th I think, you know, over time, um, there will be, you know, a pretty significant reaction once the once the new networks are rolled out because there's going to be a huge amount of people, um, you know, who are going to be severely inconvenienced because they're just going to be suffering lots of interference they didn't normally suffer from in in, in the past. Um, I think the critical difference, as far as Berg is concerned, is that most of those users will be potentially unlicensed users, and from Berg's perspective, uh, we have never been able to go into Ofcom and condone the illegal use of wireless mics. We just simply couldn't do that. So up until this point, um, we've always been, uh, you know, arguing on the on the on the behalf of of, of, of proper legal, you know, what uh, licensed users. Uh, however, I think the Channel 70 issue, uh, if and when it hits, um, has a much broader potential because there you've got a load of people who are operating in uh, license exempt spectrum. They have bought, whether it's their wireless headphone or whether it's their, I don't know, Sennheiser Freeport wireless microphone or whether it's even their baby alarm who bought this stuff in good faith. And then suddenly, as a result of a technology that Ofcom have allowed to be deployed in the frequencies immediately below, they no longer work anymore. And 
we'll see. But um, you know, if that is the case, then uh, that's a, that, uh, my view is that that's a kind of that's a kind of consumer witch issue, possibly. I don't know. But again, we, it's, it's, at the moment, it's an unknown unknown because we don't know how much uh, interference is going to be caused. At the back. Yeah, I don't. I don't think they're affected. I think they're. No, and a, and a lot of those kind of a home products all kind of operate around about two point four gigs, so they're all license yeah. exempt anyway. Yeah. Um. Um. Yeah, I mean RFID is uh, slightly above. Well, it's in channel seventy, but further up, isn't it? Mm. Further away from eight, it's above eight six five. So, but again, you know, it depends on how far the interference travels. Yeah. You know, it's the, there's 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 a huge potential for cock up here and. You know, although the mobile phone companies and the, off and the, the offcoms of this world are, 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 are giving the 790 to uh, 85 or 862 thing as, uh, up as a done deal, um, you know, there will be, I'm absolutely convinced, to use Jonathan's phrase, unintended consequences. You know, but uh, we'll see. Is it still, still largely on regulators? Uh, it seems there's more cases on the radio spectrum down there. I think you would describe the regulatory system in, in Italy as loose. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it, Italy's an absolute nightmare. I mean, you talk to people that go out there with 800 meg kit, and it's just, even you know they've done, it's very very difficult to find frequencies out there. And that's one of the countries that will be uh, not in, I suspect, uh, the the first wave anyway of LTE rollout. And I think, you know, that, you know, we've had the situation in this country as well where you actually have, you know, bands coming over from America bringing, you know, their own equipment. And a lot of the time it hasn't, hasn't been licensed. Um, and that happens. And it has to be said, you know, that part of the reason why that actually happens is, you know, Ofcom effectively had pretty much nobody actually working on enforcement, you know. How their own many admission. prosecutions have there been but in the last 10, no, let's make it 15 years for illegal wireless microphone use. Anybody has it to guess? No, no, no. Correct. <laughs> because Absolutely. nobody wants an enforcement. Yeah. You know, and that, 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 I mean, that in itself would have acted as a, as a, as a stick maybe to, to, to encourage people to, to, to do the right thing and to licence. You know, and again, I stress it's absolutely critical that people licence. Um, and then you, sorry. Hi. Uh, I work in like resale of uh, radios and hire of radios. Yep. I'm a little bit concerned at the minute that everybody's running headlong for Channel 38. Mm. And a lot of resellers should be looking more at actually trying specific site licenses for venues and their equipment. Absolutely. So when they actually want to come back to you and say, I need another 12 channels for this week, they come and hire Channel 38 because you've yep. got some easy. Now at the minute, the whole world and its dogs seems to be going for Channel 38. Well, our, 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 our view is, it echoes that, which is that, you know, our view is that 30H is really should be viewed as a mobile thing. Yeah, so, um, you know, if you're, an, if you're an ENG news crew, if you're a band that's travelling up and down the country, um, those sort of people really are the people that should be looking to use Channel 38 because they need nationwide access. You know, if, you, if you're a news crew, you could be in Liverpool one day, you could be in Stoke the next day, you could be in London the next day. So you, you need to have access to frequencies all over the country. If, if systems are being used in a fixed location, then they should absolutely be, be licensed in the interleave spectrum or the white space, whatever you want to call it, on a where, when and for how long basis. Unfortunately, that costs more. But the longer term cost implications in terms of losing access to, to spectrum are far greater. And you know, when if any of you here resell, if you're if you're putting into putting products into installations, uh, you need to stress that and say, look, I'm sorry, it's going to cost you this much to do it. But if you don't do it, three, four, five years down the line, this resource is not going to be available. Yeah. Uh, and again, for the other reasons I mentioned, you know, you need to protect, we need to protect ourselves, basically. And the, yeah, and the only thing... We are still in trouble about for ourselves. I think in a oh, yeah. period of time when the euphoria is gone and everybody's bought the Channel 38 for us to use it, yeah. we're all going to stitch each other. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, from, from our, well, certainly from my perspective, you know, I view Channel 38 as really a mobile thing. Yes. And, uh, uh, you know, short term moving around, but if it, if it's a school, 
if it's a church, if it's a college, if it's a lecture theatre, and the stuff's not going anywhere, please fix site licence every time. Uh, sorry, just... just the only thing to, to Ofcom is an advertisement of the fact that if you're not licensed, uh, you should be. Ofcom can't nationalise. Uh, yeah, off, we actually only found that after five years of dealing with Ofcom, I think it was about three months ago, we actually were told categorically in a meeting uh, Ofcom aren't allowed to advertise. Yeah, well, the fact is you've got schools, <laughs> small places. Absolutely. Travelling bands have got, you know, X, X number of. The very, very first meeting we had with Ofcom, which stretches back nearly five years ago, one of the first things we actually said to them was, people know they need a TV licence because it's advertised on TV, it's in the newspapers, and they send you mailers as well. Yep, so that's how you know. So how does anybody here know that you need to have a licence for a radio microphone? We, are, I mean, we actually suggested a, 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 a setting up a kind of licensing scheme, and um, they... <coughs> they knocked it back and said, oh, it would be too difficult to administrate. Well, they do it with TV licences. You buy a TV. It's on the yes. of the shop to take your details down to send for licence. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's do what... that with radio licences as well. Sennheiser, if you supply someone with 12 radio receivers and racks, you tell Ofcom that this has gone out to that country. The, the, the quote was, that would require government legislation. We asked the question, well, yeah, can't true. you go and get the government legislation? <laughs> that's, that's not... That's well, not... No. That's too complicated. What they don't want to do is actually get involved in actually having government actually develop new policy. They have a policy. Ofcom were actually given their, <coughs> their mandate, their power to be by the Telegraphy Act, which actually, if you go back and read it, doesn't even mention PM, to PMSE. So the whole mandate that Ofcom were actually given to operate on in the first place didn't recognise that any of you people actually existed. The, the way they work, sorry. So wouldn't they know then how many receivers are out there in, in, in Britain? They haven't got a clue. No, if they did that, they would. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, they're well, not yeah, common but, sense. But, but bear in <laughs> mind, we're in the way of what they want to do. Yeah. It's actually not in their interest. No, I, know. Yeah. I mean, the way they work is quite simple. They will slip out an announcement on uh, their website of a consultation or whatever it is, and they sit back and they wait for responses. They don't proactively contact anybody. They don't proactively contact interested parties. You have to be signed up for Ofcom updates and if, or be, have an active interest in going to their site regularly to see what's going on. That's a good point, Alan. This you came know. in today, okay? Talking about, I can't find it. I'm not being rude by trying to operate my back very well for presenting. Uh, sent by Radio Spectrum Bouncers at lists.ofcom.org.uk. Ofcom has today called for inputs from stakeholders on the long-term demand for spectrum in the range of 470 to 790 MHz. This will be used to develop a strategic approach for the future management of this spectrum. That's the spectrum we've just been talking about, yeah? So, I happen to be signed up, so I've got that. How many else, how many else of you knew that? But actually, it will affect, it will affect everybody here. The only way you would actually know that maybe you should actually be looking at that consultation and actually respond to it. The only way you'd know that is if you went to the Ofcom website. How, so is, how is that keeping people informed? I encourage everybody in this room to go away, look that up, uh, tell, all their, tell all your friends, and email them. Say, we use Spectrum. We're here. We're, now, we're not some future technology that may or may not deliver benefits to citizens and consumers. We do that now. All of us consume what's made using this stuff. All of us, we watch the TV, we go to the theatre, we go to sports events, we go to live music events. We're now, we're here, and we need to make sure that they understand that. And that's what we've been doing for the last five years. Sorry, I get a bit passionate about it. I do apologize. <laughs> uh, <laughs> any other questions? Yeah. Any, anyone else? Hello, you. So, I mean, congratulations on what you're doing. Great support and good thing. But a practical question for me. When does Channel 69 end? Uh, back, well, <clears throat> in theory, back end of 2012. Totally. Um, I think I've mentioned earlier, at the beginning of this process, Ofcom saw themselves as leading lights. They were driving the whole digital agenda forwards. Uh, they wanted to be the first to market with the spectrum. What's happened is that they've been effectively stalled by a continual stream of litigation 
from the mobile companies who are arguing about their existing spectrum holdings, uh, whether or not they're allowed to bid for 800. Uh, some of the argument is that the people that have got 900 meg spectrum need to give some of that up in order that they can qualify to bid for 800 meg spectrum. There's been a huge amount of argument and, and, and lawyers have been involved and it's cost everybody fortunes. So that's put them back, basically. They've Ofcom are two and a half years behind their original schedule. In Germany, they've already sold it. They just went, we're not entertaining any of this, <laughs> get on with it, and they sold it. They got eight point something billion euros for it. The reason I mention that is because at the moment, Ofcom's plan is to consult, again, get the auction out there beginning part of next year, sell the spectrum by the end of by, by third quarter 2012, it will be in the hands of the of, of the new the licenses will be in the hands of the operators, and then they roll out their new networks. Three down links, 790 to whatever, guard bands, <coughs> three up links. How many mobile phone operators have we got in the UK? Four. So, when the terms of the auction come out, you know, Ofcom are very good at designing an auction that steers the resource to particular people. One of those operators is going to lose out massively. So there could well be more delay, more litigation. Legal if challenge. that happens, we can probably justifiably turn their own argument on them and say, well, the most efficient use of spectrum is to continue using channel 69 until you sort with all that out. But I suspect that come third quarter, end of 2012, JFMG will be told don't issue any more licenses for Channel 69. At which point, if you can't get a license to operate on it, you're illegal, right? So, I hope that answers your question. So, it, you know, that's, that's their plan, but as we've seen over the years, their plans change. So, you know, it's not nothing set in stone. Absolutely, it's not about the money, but do you see how hard to bid for 38 No, no. you can't. No. Uh, 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 as, an indus as an industry, part of the reason why we now have this special status and identification is because one of the arguments that Berg very, very successfully actually got them to agree to was the fact that the entertainment industry, which we're all part of one way or another, is a very, very diverse and fragmented industry. Not like a mobile phone, a phone company, Vodafone or Telefonica, want to go and bid for Spectrum, easy thing to do. It's my big check account. Yeah. <laughs> But the entertainment industry is made up of everybody from performers to rental companies, uh, everything, everything that all makes up the greater entertainment industry. How would you, how would you get all those people together to raise money to buy Spectrum? It's impossible. We all rely on it, but to get everybody together to actually purchase it, it just wouldn't happen. You know, how many, how many in the audio industry, how many organisations do you have? I think the last count was about seven or eight, all doing little bits of the industry. It's difficult enough to try and get all them to come together to agree on a way of going forward to do something. So to get everybody together to actually find a way to raise billions never happened. And that's why we got the special status. They understand what the industry is all about and they understand that it's very diverse, fragmented, and it will never be in a position to actually operate in a market economy. Some things don't work in a market economy. The entertainment industry is one of them.